And there were so many, it was an extraordinarily important historic day in American history. We looked at nine different events, any one of which would have been a major point in the news, uh, a major moment in American history. And they all happened the same day. That is the same two week period from the storming of the Capitol up to the inauguration. So we spent uh, first half doing that. And the second half I had promised we'll be looking into some uh, history that black history in America that you do not learn about in the schools. You don't learn about in school. Um, and the episode happened in the center of Louisiana in 1873 little town of Colfax, Louisiana, where there was a massacre of uh, a large part of the black population by white supremacists. And the reason uh, virtually none of us had ever heard about that, but it was very important because the white supremacists who slaughtered many blacks were never they were brought to court, but they were never held accountable and none of them went to prison. Um, and because of that episode, the word spread rapidly through the slave states of the South, the Deep South and the Upper South, um, that in Colfax, the white members of the Ku Klux Klan and the white supremacists were not held accountable and they literally got away with murder. And that helped set the tone for the next 100 years uh, of American history where um, there was lynching uh, and all sorts of uh, abuse and uh, slaughter of blacks in the country. The, uh, today, what's the theme of the day? Today. Well, we're, again, we're asking the question, what did the African slaves contribute to our country? What have African-Americans contributed to the United States? Today, we're looking into another answer, namely music. We can go to the, the next picture, by the way. Um, the Africans brought music and rhythm the African and other features of the African culture. Uh, but if you look at the uh, first picture. Deirdre, can you enable screen sharing? Calling Deirdre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the voice of Emily Nelson, who we, whom we can't get along without here in the studio. Done. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, in this photograph, this, of course, is the long, in Africa, the long march from the hinterland where um, tribal chieftains have rounded up and enslaved, kidnapped other Africans and sent them on the long, long march down to the sea coast, to the Atlantic sea coast, uh, where they would be loaded on the ships for the horrible crossing, the Middle Passage to the Americas. And um, as you can see, the African slaves are not bringing anything with them. They don't have any uh, suitcases, no baggage. So it appears that they are bringing nothing with them to the new world. Okay, true or false? The kidnapped Africans in chains, many of them naked, did not bring anything with them. Well, it's false. These Africans brought a lot with them. Um, their centuries, possibly millennia, of their music and rhythm in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, music was totally central to their culture. And they had for centuries, extraordinarily complex, sophisticated rhythms that's played mostly on their drums, but other instruments also. 
So what I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, some, go to the end and summarize the importance of what the Africans brought. This is in your outline, although uh, many of you got your outlines late. I'm going to read this from your outline. Uh, American music, American music is the most listened to music in the world by far. And American music is a combination. The melody and harmony of our music comes from Europe um, and uh, whites of North America, but originally from Europe. And the blending, <clears throat> the blending of European melody with African rhythm has created some of the richest music in the world. And American music, the combination of the white, white uh, music, music from Europe and the black music from Africa, the combination of those blending together could only have happened in America. Our extraordinarily rich variety of music could only have developed in America. That is, um, so today what we're, we're gonna follow the course of the musical talent and rhythm of African slaves through the 400 years of their experience in American history from back from the plantations, uh, spirituals and work songs to uh, uh, spirituals that became popular among the white population, spirituals, minstrel shows, blues, the blues, gospel music, gospel singing, ragtime, the ragtime piano, jazz, and jazz that uh, developed into several different styles and all the way up to rap music, hip hop, and even break dancing in the Bronx. So that is um, bottom line, the blacks have contributed extraordinary, possibly more than we even realize to the American culture, American music and dancing. <clears throat> um, Uh, with the Africans, the, uh, the rhythms that the Africans brought were so embedded in them, so central to their culture for many centuries, it's uh, as if that musical rhythm, very sophisticated complex rhythm, rhythm uh, was embedded in their DNA, it's as if it were they were born with it in their bones. Anyway, that's where we're going today. Um, so from the long march, the uh, slaves got to the coast. This is one of the slave forts along the coast of Ghana. Ghana is on that south coast. Uh, you have the Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Ghana. Uh, formerly Dahomey, Benin, Nigeria, all those countries today, which didn't exist as sovereign states this time. But there is a, um, this is a, it's actually a very beautiful fort setting of uh, palm trees on the sunny coast, the slave coast and the gold coast of Africa. And um, this, so this is called the Cape Coast Fort, and not too far away is Elmina, another very, very famous slave court, slave fort, uh, built by the Portuguese. That was the oldest, probably the largest, uh, and most important of the many. But along the coast of Ghana alone, there there are sixty slave forts. Uh, that's really extraordinary. That shows the massive number of black captives were brought down, put into dungeons here in the um, slave forts. Take a, we're gonna take a detailed look at this one. Um, this belonged to the English principally. So the 
the Portuguese had were the first to develop forts along here, then the English. Um, beautiful picture of this fortress with a row of 17th century cannons. But this is a reminder that uh, altogether, the number of kidnapped Africans who came to the New World through these forts amounted to about 12 and a half million enormous population drained from Africa. And of those, about an estimated 2 million died en route, died uh, some along the long march here and some even in the dungeons here. And of course, along the Middle Passage. Uh, several pictures because this fort is so interesting. And by the way, let's go back. Um, Barack Obama and Michelle, his wife, visited this fortress. That's when he was a US Senator, before he was elected president, but he wanted to get in touch with his roots. And so this extraordinarily interesting fort is where the Obamas had visited. This is not on, this is off the beaten path. You have to want to get here. Uh, this is a sign above one of the male slave dungeons. There's a, there were female dungeons, but this one is, uh, it's not a huge room at all. And this picture shows there was no light in it. There was, it was one tiny window, but this uh, ditch, this drain is the only sewer. There were as many as a couple hundred people crammed into this small dungeon. There were no toilets except for this little drain. Um, they didn't get much food. Um, they had to sleep on the ground, tried to, although there was no room for all of them to lie down. So think of the mess here of uh, the sewage, all the sewage had to go through this little drain outside or just remain on the floor. It was not a pretty sight. And this is the doorway through which the slaves passed aboard the ships. Um, first the Portuguese ships and then the English uh, for centuries through this doorway was the last side of Africa. This uh, cannon and these black kids, this is another nearby fortress, uh, slave fort. And here is right beside the slave fort, this interesting picture of all the fishing boats and hundreds of Africans. This is right beside the Cape Coast fort today, very alive. Um, these people are descendants of those who survived the slave traders. Um, this map is good of the of West Africa, but it shows right in the center is Ghana. And you see it's not, a, a, I can't remember how many miles long is the coastline here, but um, just along that coast, there were 60 different slave fortresses. And then over to the right is Nigeria, which we'll be visiting uh, later. This map shows the main slave routes and the shaded, the, the uh, colored shaded part of Africa there is the area where the large bulk of African slaves came from to the New World. Uh, this interesting picture shows a, well, this is a book, it's an over 500 page book, but it's interesting. Um, it's called The Slave Trade uh, by Hugh Thomas. He's an excellent historian and writer. But this picture shows how many slaves were crammed, not on top of the deck, but between decks in chains um, with virtually no sewage. A close up of that drawing. One other thing that the slaves brought with them was the memory of musical instruments they had and played in Africa. The memory of the African musical instruments, principally the drums, but there were all kinds of other instruments. Um, and that, this picture is taken in Senegal, West Africa. And this is a 
good illustration of the type of instruments that the Africans had for a very long time. I've forgotten the name of the instrument, something like a conga, but take a good look at it. It's a large gourd, it's about uh, 12 to 15 inches, about 15 inches across with a slice cut off. And you can see the animal skin stretched over the open face of the gourd and then a long arm. So this is a predecessor to the banjo, uh, the American instrument in, uh, invented on the cotton plantations. But its predecessor it kind of came from Africa and the slaves brought the memory of this and other instruments with them. Um, this map shows Senegal up at the top left. And that's where the, the, that photograph was taken. There's a lot of fabulous, uh, it was a French colony, a lot of fabulous musical groups there. Here is another uh, African with a, a similar uh, instrument to the banjo, a very long neck, uh, similar predecessor of the banjo. And here's a third one. Here is, you can see the animal skin stretched over the gourd uh, very clearly on this one. And this instrument has three strings as also. It's a three string, see that's right. Three stringed instrument uh, plucked just like an American banjo. Now this is, this historic painting is a, a plantation down in South Carolina. And here you can see over on the right, uh, a slave, a plantation slave in South Carolina playing the banjo, which was developed, continually developed by the plantation slaves. And they, the, there's only one musical instrument that is truly American, and that is the banjo invented by the African Americans. And the fellow in the middle is uh, dancing. There's a drum, if you look, uh, Hard to see, but there's a drum here. Oh, on the far right is a drummer playing a gourd. Uh, um, so the music was kept alive on the, you can see the slave quarters in the back in the distance. You can see the plantation manor house and the slave quarters. <clears throat> um, so this is a, a valuable historic painting. You can see how the slaves kept their music alive this is a wonderful painting uh, by Tanner. And um, this came out of the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s in Harlem. Here is a wonderful group. This picture I took in uh, New Orleans. Diana and I lived there for a time. Um, this is the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Preservation Hall, Dixieland Jazz Band. It's right in the middle of the French Quarter, um, just off Bourbon Street. And uh, Diana and I lived for, as I say, lived in the French Quarter on Burgundy Street, just two blocks north. So any night of the week, we could walk from our slave quarters. We uh, very fortunately were able to rent uh, building that had been slave quarters for 30 years before the Civil War. In any case, living uh, in the French Quarter was a, a wonderfully rich experience. So we got to know several of these musicians. This was back in 1970, 71. And some of these uh, musicians, Percy Humphrey playing the trumpet there, for example, the drummer, um, they are old enough that they are the ones who, some of the ones who began, created Dixieland jazz in New Orleans back in the teens. Now this picture shows on the right is the contemporary banjo. That man is Narvin Kimball, whom we got to know. Um, he act, here's a, Here's another picture of Narvin Kimball. One, he's a, a mailman by day and a Dixieland jazz musician by night. 
Um, we got to know him. He actually did some work on Diana's banjo. He knows his banjos <laughs> better than we do. Anyway, he took Diana's banjo and did some uh, improvements on it. Narvin Kimball. So that's the, the good look at the only true American instrument, the banjo, developed, invented by African Americans here. I hear Diana is playing on the same on, on her banjo. This is uh, at the legendary Antlers Tavern where we played music started, started 52 years ago. Uh, and the, the banjo is, looks exact. It's a tenor banjo, by the way, not a bluegrass, not a four, four five string banjo. This, this banjo that the Africans developed was uh, played in the Dixieland bands and it's a four string tenor banjo. Um, oops. Uh, we were, uh, one of the interesting things we did in Africa, in Senegal, in Dakar, we went to a huge market and uh, uh, one of the biggest African markets. And uh, there was, a, we found a band playing African rhythms, wonderful African rhythms. Not this picture, but I, this picture I took in uh, Sierra Leone in uh, West Africa. But I put this picture in to show the drums. Uh, that largest drum you see behind the marimbas or uh, xylophone. Um, a lot of that's a standard size drum. The other two drums on the left are a little smaller. But uh, the question is how before before a performance, drummers usually tune up, tighten the, the uh, skin on their drums. Now, if you've watched a garage band or any band in the United States, you see the drummer tightening up the heads. He takes a metal key and then cranks up around the rim and that tightens the drum head so it will sound at its best. Well, of course, African drums have animal skin stretched over a wood hollow log or some uh, limb. Uh, a wooden cylinder. How do the Africans tighten the drum heads? And this was a fabulous thing to see. The, the group before they performed in Dakar, in the marketplace, they built a bonfire and take the drums and set it a safe distance. They knew exactly how far with the animal skin of the drum head facing the bonfire so they knew exactly, in other words, they warmed up the drum head uh, and got it a little bit tighter. Then it was ready for the performance. That was one of the many wonderful uh, pieces of luck we had. We brought good luck with this a lot. Um, now there was a uh, Walt Disney, oops, Walt Disney produced a film in uh, 1946 called the song of the south if you're old enough to remember it was a it won the academy award best movie best film of the year and the song with it zippity doodah won the oscar for the best uh, adaptation of a, a music um it was a, a very popular music with many and the, point, and the point here is that another thing that the African slaves brought from Africa with them was the memory of their folk songs. They had animal stories all over West Africa, their own version of animal stories, wis wisdom stories. And the, of course the uh, slaves remembered those and they kept telling, uh, telling their children these animal stories. And to the ancient Greeks, it was Aesop's fables to the African slaves, it was the animal stories and including stories, the most probably most familiar one is this one right here. Brer Rabbit, this is Brer Rabbit, Brer Fox, Brer Bear and the Tar Baby. Um, a very successful uh, song and uh, story. Um, 
to follow through with it, by the way, it was from the beginning, it was very controversial with many of those who were familiar with uh, African-American history. Here's Uncle Remus, the storyteller. And this is the story of a plantation in the South where the uh, two the two children, Uncle Remus, uh, the a gentle old avuncular slave, tells uh, the, the kids like him, the white children of the plantation like him. Uh, so he's so lovable and they get along really well with the, the elderly slave. But the story, uh, the Song of the South, the story of this plantation is so romanticized and so unreal that uh, it got a lot of slack for being uh, racist. It was in fact a racist film and you can't get it on, try to, try to get this movie today. It was pulled off by Walt Disney uh, soon after it was released in the early 40s. Tried to bring it back th two or three times. But again, it was uh, the outrage against it because it was racist. Finally, drove, uh, Walt Disney pulled it off permanently. So it'd be nice to be able to see this as an example of racist, but uh, fascinating, very entertaining um, and story. Good luck on trying to get a copy today. Uh, in, uh, on the plantations, of course, the Africans, African slaves kept their music alive. <clears throat> <clears throat> and the drumming was really the most important instrument because that's what carried their complicated, sophisticated rhythms. But now here, this is this picture of Le Vieux Carré. Le Vieux Carré, that is the French Quarter. The French translates as the old quarter. It's the oldest part of New Orleans. But this is the heart of historic New Orleans. And if you look, I don't have an arrow to point out, but Congo Square, if you look at the top along the round part, they have fortress walls around it originally. That square at the top center is Congo Square. And on Sundays, Sunday afternoons, the slaves were allowed to bring their drums uh, and play music, play their fabulous rhythms, which the whites really enjoyed uh, watching and listening to. Um, <clears throat> so the, but on the plantations, um, eventually drumming was banned, well, especially after the Nat Turner rebellion and massacre of 1831. Um, drumming was absolutely banned because the, uh, the whites were afraid that the drums were sent, could send messages to long distances to other slaves and incite slave rebellion. And that's absolutely true. So it was more, much more difficult after. The Nat Turner, if you're not familiar with the Nat Turner rebellion, he was a preacher, a minister in uh, Virginia. And he uh, organized a rebellion. This is a, the ugly side of slavery that the slaves were so abused <coughs> <coughs> that they were driven to outright rebellion knowing that they might well be killed. So Nat Turner organized the rebellion and they started going from, they killed, they killed the uh, women and children as well, but they killed from one, they went from one farm to another. This was not a huge plantation area. It was smaller farms. They went from one farm to another, killing all the whites that they encountered. <clears throat> and they marauded for four days through this area of Virginia. Finally, it was, uh, the whites organized militias as fast as they could. They finally tracked down, and Nat Turner himself was, uh, it was a, actually, he stayed, he survived for two months hiding in the woods. 
they finally captured him, he was hanged. And if I remember correctly, he was uh, drawn and quartered, cut up into pieces. Um, also, as a result of that slave rebellion in Virginia, a lot of new laws went into effect. The white, virtually every white in the South was scared to death after that rebellion. Slaves marauded for four days, killing whites on different plantations, including women and children. So new laws were put into place uh, with the purpose of tightening control over the slaves. Uh, and even freedmen. Uh, one of the many laws said no education for the slaves. We do, you may not teach slaves how to read or write because, well, a slave who could read or write could send written messages. So uh, it, that Turner's Rebellion had all kinds of ripple effects. By the way, it was not, <clears throat> some plantation owners uh, insisted on teaching gifted slaves uh, how to read and write and do mathematics because they were good at keeping the account books, accounting and other services to run the plantation. Nonetheless, uh, those were the new laws. But still, uh, Blacks can still get together in places like Congo Square. So the drumming rhythm could not be squelched, could not be stamped out. Um, now we're going to go, spirituals, of course, were developed and work songs on the plantation. Now we're going to go through a series of music, forms of music that the African Americans created. This group right here are the Christie Minstrels. Uh, if you're old enough to remember during the 1960s, one of the popular musical groups were the new Christie Minstrels. Um, excellent uh, singing group. But a few people remember the old Christie Minstrels. And here you have a picture of them. There are um, a group of singers and musicians. And Mr. Christie, um, Edwin Christie, is, uh, that's his portrait on the top. And the bottom you have two, two of the minstrels dancing, a guy and a lady. This group started, uh, um, Christie started this group, Edwin Christie, in 1843. That was 20 years before the Civil War. Uh, so, and the irony is, if you look at the minstrels there, they were white guys, white people with black faces. So this is the first known case of black faced minstrels. Um, and uh, they were very popular. This next picture shows that this is the, uh, the black-faced performers. Al Jolson, of course, is one of the most famous recent performers singing songs like Swanee and uh, Mammy. Um, and of course, blackface is now totally gone as a disgrace, a symbol of racism. But soon after uh, Christie's minstrels were started in 1843 in Buffalo, New York, by the way. The blacks, um, especially freedmen, decided to take up the same form of music or the same form and they adapted and created their own, the real minstrel groups. Um, and they would go on tour. Um, and by the way, that, the, the the black minstrel shows evolved into vaudeville. So vaudeville of the 1910s and 20s and, and even 30s um, came out of the minstrel shows. And in the minstrel shows, the blacks would form a single line and parade across the stage doing these wild uh, distorted dances, strutting wildly. And they even would strut through the audience sometimes 
and the the white audience is they really liked uh, minstrels so the audience was loving it and here's the great irony was <clears throat> the audience did not understand what the where the how the minstrel strutters got their dances they were slaves on the plantation who imitated mimicked their masters the whites the way the whites walked around uh, was seen as pompous and uh, um, just an unnatural strutting wild strutting and so that's and the uh, the slaves and the minstrels were copying that and um, mocking the whites. So that, that's an interesting uh, little known background to the minstrel shows. And of course, then the new minstrel, new Christie minstrels appeared in the 1960s. Um, Okay, the next form of music is the blues. The blacks created the blues came principally from the plantation, from the cotton fields, the plantations. Um, and, and it's interesting because like ragtime and jazz coming just a bit later, ragtime and jazz have roots that are easily traceable. In fact, we will um, trace the roots of Ragtime piano and Dixieland jazz, but the blues are different. There is no discernible ancestors. There are no direct ancestors to the American blues. The blues just sprung up uh, in this country among blacks, pretty much from the cotton field. And the blues are sorrow songs. They're sad music. Um, they sing of the backbreaking back labor in the cotton fields. They had to work from sunrise till sunset as long as there was light. So the blues sings out the physical pain and the hope for freedom, which they did not expect ever to see in their lifetimes. The blacks expected to see freedom only after they die. That those are some of the themes you see in the blues, the original blues that sprung out of the cotton fields. <clears throat> now the blues also, you see, it's a sad music. It, it it sings of broken relationships, tragic events, things that have gone wrong in in their lives. Um, so again, it's a totally original. American musical form created totally by the African-Americans, one of the many gifts from the African-Americans. Uh, and why is, why is it called the blues? Well, of course, largely because of the sad content, but also uh, musically, the blues are normally a pitch lower on the major scale. That helps give it, uh, oh, we get to a blue note later. Well, a blue note in short is a note that comes out of the African languages. It's a note between, if you look at their musical score, um, if you look at the musical score, um, the notes are either on a line or a space. Well, the blacks, based on the languages from West Africa, they have a vocal trait that goes up and down. A blue note is one that's in between uh, the line, in between the, ma the notes on a major scale. Um, so that you cannot notate, you can't write that in a musical score because you don't know where it is. Um, here are a couple of pictures of the cotton fields from, oops, cotton field where uh, the blues originated. Um, and when Diane and I were living in New Orleans in the French Quarter, 
we got to know a neighbor, this man right here named Babe Stovall. And he, he began life as a cotton picker in Mississippi. He was out picking cotton, singing, and he was, it was a luck, RCA Victor, person from RCA Victor happened to hear him singing the blues in the cotton field. And he was so good. He was a really a gifted blues singer and composer. Um, he, was con uh, he was given a contract to start making recordings with RCA Victor. And uh, here's another picture of a very interesting, wonderful guy. And he lived in our neighborhood there in the French Quarter. So in the late afternoons, evenings, we'd, uh, we'd find Babe Stovall sitting on a stoop outside his door on Burgundy Street, playing, singing the blues. How incredibly fortunate, uh, uh, just amazing. And by the way, he sang, he was one of the featured singers in the first New Orleans Jazz Festival, took place up at uh, Congo Square. Some of the greatest blues singers are Mahalia Jackson here. And uh, this is another picture of Mahalia Jackson. She, one of the highlights of my musical life has been when I was teaching at Booker T. Washington High School in the ghetto in New Orleans. Mahalia Jackson came to visit her own alma mater where she went to high school oops, and sang for the student body, 2,100 black students. And that really brought tears to my eyes. Anyway, the great Mahalia Jackson. And here is Aretha Franklin, another of the greatest blues singers. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, let's see now, I want to, I want to focus on New Orleans and the black culture in general. The, the uh, African-American culture in New Orleans is this incredibly rich and fascinating. Everything from the, the style of food, dancing. Um, now this picture, this is an aerial map of New Orleans. Of course, it's called the Crescent City. And you can see why the Mississippi River makes a huge crescent dip. Uh, and in the center of that is the oldest section of New Orleans, the French Quarter. Uh, here's another, this is another aerial photo. It is, uh, it's an old historic postcard. So you can see the color is very, it's faded and very odd. But the, the uh, print there says Mississippi River Crescent, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, uh, so a bit about the culture there. The uh, blacks, uh, the blacks had formed benevolent societies, benevolent societies. Um, and it was group, there were many groups in New Orleans, especially um, freed, slave, freed slaves, principally, almost totally. But there were groups who would get together, form a brotherhood, it was like a fraternity. And so many of them played music and sang, they formed musical groups. <clears throat> so there were musical societies and as many as a hundred members uh, of musicians and dancers belong to these groups. And of course, they were much more than that. They took care of like uh, um, labor unions. They took care of the widows and the needy when they needed help. Um, but there was a spirit. They, they speak, uh, the blacks I've heard talk about this, speak of the spirit moving them. The spirit moved them so strongly in their, their music and their dancing that they, before long, they took to the streets. And that's what you see in this amazing photograph. Uh, these, a black beneficent society, music society could not be restrained. They took to the streets 
and just march through the streets of the French Quarter, um, playing their music and dancing. That, of course, uh, led to the jazz funerals. So these benevolent societies really knew how to celebrate life. This is a celebration of life. Um, it's just, uh, and it's hard to describe, but you get the feeling if you live in New Orleans, spend any time uh, in the ghettos or in the French Quarter, you really get a feeling of this rich, fascinating culture. Now also there, Diane and I learned that there are quadroon societies. Quadroon societies, that is quadroon is, uh, means that you have one quarter black blood. So to qualify, you have to have only a quarter black blood. And they, they are very, uh, very particular and they hold a, a debutante ball every year in the spring. Um, so, so they take it very seriously. And we found even there were octoroon societies in New Orleans. Octoroons, of course, means you have one eighth black blood. You have to have just one eighth black blood to uh, qualify. <clears throat> um, um, some uh, American jazz, which we will get to. By the way, we're going to continue the Black African American music in the next session, but uh, we're going to finish up with uh, the, this note that uh, American jazz came out of African music in several different ways. One way was what I mentioned earlier was the blue notes. Uh, in Africa, the African music is, has such a vocal quality singing. They sang a lot with the music and the African languages are such <clears throat> that the Africans is not, not true, not as true, not true in the European languages, but in the words and phrases, the Africans have a music that slide the, their tone, the tone of their phrases slide up and down. And so when they start playing music and, uh, with musical instruments, they have musical instruments, all kinds of rattles, but, um, and the horns, including an elephant, a hollowed out elephant tusk, um, makes kind of a bass, uh, like a tuba sound. Anyway, the instruments copied the vocal tone, tone quality of the African languages. And of course, that creates sounds that don't fit into the European musical tradition at all. You can't draw musical notes. Uh, between the lines, you don't know where to put them between the lines. So it simply cannot be notated. Uh, so with the African, I'm gonna mention some African languages, but the African languages rely on the way phrases and words are said as much as the word itself. So the way the word is expressed vocally is just as important, more important than the word itself. So the tone of a word, um, now this next picture, oh, here's another place where uh, the music took to the streets. And this is the Eureka marching band. There were four principal marching bands when Diana and I were living in the French Quarter. Um, and this is actually at a jazz funeral. Here's a wonderful picture. And this is another group. The Society Brass Band. <clears throat> now, here's a physical, a geophysical map of Africa. And I want to point out where some of the languages come from. 
the uh, I don't have an arrow, but that area along the the east west line where you have Nigeria and Ghana and the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we're going to take a closer look there. Well, um, Swahili is one of the principal languages that has that vocal characteristic. Now this, now here's a close-up map of Nigeria. If you look closely, you'll see that, that there are two great rivers form a Y that dissect Nigeria. From the northwest corner down to the center, that's the Niger or the Niger River, one of the important, most important river of East, of, of, sorry, of West Africa. And then on the right, you see the Benue River coming from uh, north of the Cameroon. And they've come together in right the lower center and then form the mouth of the Niger River. Okay, three great languages here. The north is the, the principal language and that whole northern section is called Hausa, the Hausa language. Uh, down in the lower left, below the Niger River, that's the Yoruba language. And then the lower right, that section is the Igbo language. Then if you go north of there into the hinterland, into the Sahara Desert, uh, the upper savannah, the uh, Fulani language. So all of those languages have that same characteristic of having a, like a musical slide to the tone of their languages. Uh, right now, let's see. By the way, um, the African rhythm, we're going to find out next time that one of the important features of African rhythms is are called polyrhythm or multiple rhythms. So you have one rhythm where the accent is placed somewhere in a, in a four count bar and another rhythm that's totally different where the beat is placed a different place in a four count bar and you place one rhythm on top of the other both are emphasized and that is well it's called syncopation um, it's where the ragtime piano came from <clears throat> but uh, and some very unusual rhythms that to, that to whites i and Many other musicians simply cannot cannot discern the rhythm, what type of rhythm it is. It's so complex. But in any case, um, in, in those African languages, there's no word for rhythm. And there's no word for music. The rhythms simply rep, uh, represent the very fabric of life itself. Like rhythm and music are life itself and so the, and it's embedded so embedded in the people that they don't even have a word for them. that's quite fascinating i think and because they sing and dance to these ryth sophisticated rhythms um, i have jokingly said that there are no psychotherapists in west africa no therapists they, that's not needed because the africans get everything out therapeutically with their music dancing. Um, I'm not sure how far that would go academically, but anyway, that's <laughs> that's uh, one of my takes on African music. It's uh, so central to the lives of the West Africans that it is therapy among other things. Okay, um, our time is up for the day. And uh, here you oh. go. And uh, so, Deirdre, if you want to come back on. Yeah, that was great. How fun. Love learning all that. Yeah, yeah. African music is so fascinating. Of course, African American music is so fascinating. I just love learning more and more about it. Yes, thank you. 
Let's see. I wonder if Jim would be willing to read the questions. I, I can try. I just have a hard time seeing it. Jim, what do you think? I've got them here. I've been writing okay. them down. Thank you. Before we get started, I want to do a quick plug. Um, today is the first day of fundraising for the Twist River Grange and uh, their annual chocolate sale. This is a chocolate alert. <laughs> um, it starts today and it's going to be, if you want to buy the small box of chocolate, uh, you get it through the grant and it's doing, it's going online this year. But uh, Mary Jane Perry has made 1,500 chocolates. So anyway, so they'll, they can start today uh, ordering and it'll be delivered later. So Just we just go to the Methow Valley Grange website. That's what we put in. Yeah, I've, I've forgotten the exact, uh, but yeah. That, yeah uh, that probably would work. That sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, if you go to, if you Google Twisp, Twisp Grange, you'll get to the online ordering link, or you can go to Twisp Valley Grange Facebook page and the link is there. And there's two pickups. We're trying to do this COVID safe. Last year we did it outside of Hanks and nobody wants to do that. So we're gonna have a pickup in Twisp on the 12th and a pickup in Winthrop. So take your choice. And thank you for supporting the Grange and thanks, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. The chef of the chocolates. <laughs> okay, uh, now Jim Archibald, you have a, a question ready or an observation? Yeah, I've got uh, several questions here that I'll let people read the uh, comments and observations that others made and just focus on the questions here. Uh, one from Tim Spellman was, what was the name of the fort in Ghana that you were talking about early on there? Yeah, the name of that fort was the <clears throat> Cape Coast Fort. Cape Coast Fort. And the, the second one nearby, equally important, is El Mina. El Mina, two words, M-I-N-A. That's the oldest of those. Um, if you if you are interested in doing some exotic traveling, the coast of Ghana is really interesting, but it's off the beaten path. Not easy to get there. <laughs> Another one. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Sorry. Another one from Tim was, uh, uh, and this may be more than you want to get into in, in, in a short question and answer period, but he asked, why did reconstruction fail? Oh, well, reconstruction is a long and fascinating story. It's the 12 years after the Civil War, um, when the African Americans were given their rights, and became citizens. We're going to have at least one session on that later on. So I'd rather just wait and uh, we'll be going into it in, in quite a bit of detail. Great question though, Jim, uh, Tim, thanks. And then Walt Havens asks, uh, what's the origins of the term banjo? Where did the word come from? The word banjo, um, uh, I'm not sure. I think, I'm not sure if it came from an African word. It could well have, but I, uh, I don't know, sorry. And then Walt also asked when the antlers is going to reopen. Good question. <laughs> At the antlers started, we started 48 years ago, and the only truly American in instrument, the banjo, Diane has been playing there for a lifetime. And I have been playing uh, ragtime piano at the island started 48 years ago. It's a sad fact that the antlers closed for remodeling, or if you read the bronze plaque, it says remolding. <laughs> <laughs> I proofread that, but um, what's his name? Paul, Paul Christian didn't, uh, didn't follow my suggestion. Anyway, it's closed indefinitely, uh, and there, uh, it's, there's some legal problem that's held up, and I think in courts. But uh, so far, I don't know when it's going to reopen. It's, uh, I hope so. Paul plans to have our band do the grand opening when and if it opens. <laughs> 
we're alive. If we are still alive at that time, would be the band. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the questions I had so far, Bill. Any other uh, comments or observations? No? Bill, well, you should well, play the tune on your banjo or on the piano. Do you have your piano there? Diana have is her banjo? Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, there's no piano here in Studio A. I thought if I do, of course, we have CDs. Um, I thought of having a few bars of uh, ragtime piano on a CD, but I didn't even discuss that with Emily here, who's the technician. Would that be conceivable? Oh, good. Well, thanks for suggesting that. Possibly next time we can hear some uh, some of my ragtime piano and Diana's banjo. That would be good. Thanks for suggesting that. Who was that? Hi, Bill. Right, once, they, once they open it up, they got to use it. Bill? Yeah. Who is it? It's Dave Wright. Uh, we could play some uh, Preservation Hall jazz. We've got several records. <laughs> oh, the Preservation Hall jazz band. We're going to learn more about them next week. Um, and you have several of their records? Right. They, yeah, they are wonderful. I love the group. <clears throat> you want background, you know, we could. <laughs> <laughs> Bill? Yes. It's Bill. Um, we have this great station here, Jazz 24. If anyone doesn't know about it, it plays jazz 24 hours a day, or you can get it also through KNKX, which used to be the old uh, Pacific Lutheran station that then went private and is now a uh, independent uh network for uh, oh, names don't come anymore. Anyway, um, it has great, great choices. It has all the classics and the new, but doesn't just screech at you most of the time. So <laughs> I, I can't recommend it highly enough or too highly. It's just great. So that's uh, 24 hours of jazz. Jazz 24. So when you had all you can take of the news, you can just switch over. <laughs> Other people have it now. Got another question here, Bill. So, so Val, what's what's the name of the station? How do people get, get it? Jazz 24? I just get it from my TuneIn radio, which is some kind of a free app. And you just it's Jazz 24, and that's all it is. And they, it's got a lot of people from Europe and all over the world that listen in. Yeah. So it's uh, Tune 24. Jazz, just Jazz, J-A-Z-Z -Z 24. Okay, good. Thank you, Val. Um, and Jim, you had a message? Yeah, Julia, Julia Seaman asks, what's the uh, dominant chord in blues? Oh, in blues? Um, Minor chord, probably. <laughs> they play like D minor, A minor. I think I'm just. Uh, um, I guess I use a lot of minor chords. I, I, I suppose I'm just guessing, but uh, D minor, A minor. E minor. It doesn't matter what. The minor chords. Okay. Yeah. Or, or is there even one? I don't know. Yeah. Ask that again next week. On I need to learn more about that. Uh, I don't know. I you know I just thought that was. Yeah. Okay. What you were saying about the blues. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard. Oh hi. Do you have a question or a thought? Richard Boss. Just was it waving, okay? That's not works today, Richard. Yeah, right. <laughs> Any final comments? No. I guess not. Yeah, 
Well, um, this is Annie. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I learned a new word um, that I had to go to my phone and look up at the beginning of the, the uh, talk. Maybe the others of you are, were familiar with it, but the very first picture that Bill showed with the <laughs> slaves roped together yeah, and the caption to it said it was depicting a coffle, C-O-F-F-L-E, C -O -F -F -L -E, and that was a new word to me and I looked it up and it said a line of animals or slaves fastened or driven along together. Huh. Fascinating, yeah, thanks. It didn't give the etymology, did it? I'd like to Pardon know. Me? Um, mm, I'd like to know where the words, I'd love to know. Yeah, I probably could find it if I looked further, but. Oh. Uh, Sounds like it could be uh, an African word originally. Well, it said there's something here in the Wiktionary that says it was from the Arabic caravan and it was related to the word kafila c-a-f-i-l-a okay thank you yeah that tells me a lot uh, the arabs had a uh, thriving african slave they had the camels uh, the tanzania and kenya zanzibar, the zanzibar uh, the, the arabs had a slave trade going before long before the Europeans did. And so I'm not surprised it comes from an Arab word. And the Arab slaves, um, their slaves came from the hinterland, sometimes far, all the way to Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi, down to towards Zanzibar on the coast. And the island of Zanzibar, which by the way, there's a rich smell of cinnamon. cinnamon. Uh, yeah. That's the other spice. Anyways, oh, the great clothes market for uh, East Africa. The whole island of Zanzibar was a, like a huge slave market uh, created by the Arab from the north to come down the Red Sea and the uh, along the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Gulf. So it, that makes sense that it's an Arab word for a long line of animal um, so thank you. Yes. Hey Richard. Hey More ribs. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can have indoor seating now and come down and get some ribs inside. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. oh, my question, Bill? Yes, yeah, hi Richard. When, when Lynn and I were down in New Orleans here about five years ago, we went to Congo Square Good. and we were on a bicycle tour. And our tour guide said that the uh, slaves not only brought their drums, they brought banjos or horns or any kind of homemade instrument. Uh -huh. Would that be true, you know? Would that be what? Would it be true that there were other instruments there besides just drums? Yeah, definitely. Okay. The Africans and, and the African Americans had all kinds of rattle, like a gourd, a solid hard gourd with uh, beads wrapped all around it uh, to make a rattle. Uh, and all, and uh, I'm not, I think maracas might have come from the Latin culture, but uh, uh, with the bones, what's the term? For, uh, two wooden sticks that they bang together like spoons. Uh, what the hell is that called? Gamble, rambles. Anyway, a lot of homemade instruments, like just simply uh, dried bones, and then uh, and that developed into horse ribs. Is the, 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 the best bone for uh, playing the bones. We were playing up at the Winter Palace. Our band one time. This fellow came in. An old fellow, and he said, All right, if I join you. And he brought out his bones. He said, Of course, bones are the best. And the, 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 it was just a fab, fabulous percussion. And uh, for the last 10 years of his life, before Charlie Schmidt died here at the Antlers, when we first started at the Antlers in 1972, 
Charlie Schmidt immediately joined us. He was very good on playing the spoons. spoons. And by the way, he had his middle finger cut off twice in a band saw. Uh, he used to play the banjo, but he couldn't anymore. But he, a fellow walked into his uh, shop and said, hi, Char hi, Charlie. And Charlie glanced up and zing, part of his middle finger went flying across the room. <laughs> so he had only about this much left of his middle finger. Uh, I don't know if I should mention this, but uh, he played with us for years at the Antlers Tavern, pretty rough. It was, it was the roughest tavern in the county. Um, but when he would, a friend of his would come into the door, he'd say, well, hi, buddy, and he'd give him the finger, or rather <laughs> give him a stump of what was left of his finger. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I've got another question here. Okay. Hold it just a second, Jim. How about his bones in his hands? Oh, yeah. I, Jim, I want to finish with something. Um, when Charlie Schmidt died finally, by the way, he was working up at the House Owl Mind uh, up at uh, above Lake Chelan, up by uh, Holden Village. And he fell down a cliff uh, on the job and he was unconscious for months. But anyway, so his body was broken up, but he still uh, uh, played with our band for about 10 years. And when he finally died, uh, by the way, the first chapter in Diana's fascinating book, The Whole Damn Valley, the first episode is Charlie Schmidt, um, uh, lying in his casket and Diana went in to the funeral hall down there by the river and uh, looked at his casket and he was lying there and he had the spoons in his hands, his musical spoons in his hands. He was buried with the bones in his hands and that, that was really a wonderful I thought. And, uh, now Jim, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, that's fine. Uh, uh, Vicki asks, uh, one of the things I wonder about is the history of slavery itself. I know this is a big subject. Is there some information about, about the beginning of slavery or as far as we know, is slavery a part of human history as far back as we know? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, if I think most of you have gotten my suggested reading list. Um, the reading list has uh, it's three pages and it's got no single book, although yesterday I finally found uh, a textbook that's used in some colleges and high schools, and I don't remember the two authors. I will, uh, I will add that to the reading list. Maybe I'll bring it next time. It's one of the very few that covers the history of American black history in America period from 1619 to 2019, 400-year history in a single book. But it's so unusual. Uh, Gates Jr. has another one, but uh, it's it's deficient, I think, in the early period of the uh, slavery. But there are a lot of niche books, like uh, no, Julianne. Uh, like the you saw a picture today of, uh, with the uh, drawing of the slave ship. Um, that's called the slave trade, and that was that's excellent for covering that period. Just quite a, quite a quite a long period of the slave trade. So what I do is go over that list, um, and I have not suggested a single one as a textbook because uh, I just didn't find one that was really suitable. Um, taking slavery back, to, and I it would be really interesting to take slavery back to the beginning of recorded history. Um, and I'm sure they began with Mesopotamia, if, uh, probably Sumeria, definitely Assyria and Mesopotamia, uh, slave to build the great ziggurats. Um, that would be interesting in uh, Greek and Roman slavery, but I don't know of one that goes back that far. Bill? Okay, yeah, Jim? Yeah, 
Bill Moody. Oh, Bill Moody, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, one that uh, goes back into 1300 and talks about European slavery and sets the, uh, kind of sets it up for the transfer that into the Americas was stamped from the beginning, stamped from the beginning by Kendi. It has a pretty good, uh, pretty good recollection and talks about the different concepts of, uh, of blacks uh, and uh, the different theories about their blackness and why. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, stamped from the beginning has a you know, pretty good, uh, relatively early history. Good. Thank you, Bill Moody, for uh, suggesting that. Um, that was, I think that was the first book written by Abram X. Kendi, uh, really an important writer. And I do remember that that book does go back to, I think the 13th century of slavery um, as it was known in Europe. Uh, yeah, thank you. And that is, that's a pretty high on the reading list, by the way, on the first page. Okay, well, we've uh, gone slightly over time. Uh, Deirdre, are you still there? I am, and I was just wondering one last thing, if we could see Patty's painting. Oh, yeah. Inspired by your talk today. Oh, oh, all right. Very nice. Wow. Is that on share? Calling Patty. Thank you. You're going to have to auction these off. It could be a, a benefit for the library or something. You're You're muted. Oh, okay, Patty is with it. <laughs> did you do the painting this time? What did you say? <laughs> I said for MAH, maybe. Oh, wow. look at that. That's so beautiful. Oh, this morning. That's a painting yes. of this morning. It's wonderful. Wow. But it, it looks like outside. It was jazz inspired. You totally. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, many, Bill. Yes. I'm wondering, Patty, how many people could do a painting like that in one hour? Yeah. Emily said. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I have to think about it for a few years. <laughs> yeah, right. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Thank you, Mahard. Yeah, thanks, 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 Bill, Deidre, and Jim. Bye-bye. See you next week. Yes. All right. How do you you want to stay on, Bill, so we can talk about stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we'll let everybody get off and then you can ask me some questions. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, no, they're getting off. Yeah, they're just, they're leaving. <laughs> well, you can go ahead and ask. It doesn't matter if they're there. I can't, I don't have the power to do that. No. Yeah, there's, for some reason I can't, I can't delete people. They have to leave themselves. Oh. Um, yeah. And there's 12 people that are, 11 people that are still on. That's okay. But you, you had some questions about yeah. something. I'm thinking, um, actually, I think I need to call you a, a bit, a, few, a bit later because uh, I have to pull, pull the, uh, ideas together. That's okay. That makes sense. That's fine. I'll be around today. So. Okay, good. So later in the morning, I'll give you a call. Okay. Yeah, thank you, dear. Director. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. I'm going to end it. Bye-bye.